Thank you for that. And I'm going to just ask, as um, Dr. O'Donnell said, we'll have Dr. Graf come up, and she's going to be presenting on updates in CLL, and she is from the Mission Cancer and Blood. Thank you. So I am not mic'd up, but I talk loud, and so this should not be an issue. Um, unfortunately, I wore the wrong outfit this morning. I know better. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I am from Des Moines, Iowa, so the middle of the country, sort of, um, where I work at a very, very large um, community oncology group. Um, in my previous life, I was in academics, and now for the last eight and a half years, I've been in community, so I'm kind of an academic community hybrid, which is you know, an interesting place to be because I understand both sides of you know, the spectrum when we talk about trying to make things available you know, across the country, you know, especially in the community where we see patients first. Um, you know, the cool thing about doing CLL, lymphoma, and especially myeloma, but I'm going to kind of pick on CLL and myeloma in a good respect, is that the treatment landscape is changing every 30 seconds. I mean, so, which is awesome for a patient, very hard for a physician if you're not attending meetings because, you know, how do you keep up, especially if you're seeing, you know, 15, 16 other disease states. So um, I'm going to do my best to, you know, kind of hone in on the key data from ASH. Um, I've got 70-some slides, and that was cut down from my original set. So I'm going to try my best to do this in 30 minutes, but I'm starting a little bit early, so we'll see. But the cool thing is all these slides are available, um, so if I do gloss over things, you will have them, and I'm going to try to not look at that light. Okay, so let's focus on the updates from uh, Ash, looking at from CLL. Okay, just really quickly, um, so, you know, with CLL, just because someone's diagnosed with CLL does not mean they need treatment. Just because someone has their first relapse does not mean somebody needs treatment. Um, the thing with CLL, it's important to remember, is that it truly, you know, for the most part, affects, you know, older individuals, patients, you know, average age of 70. Now, that's, you know, that's the median. Obviously, there's people on both sides of the spectrum. But it's really important in this patient population to realize there are going to be other comorbidities, you know, and so toxicities are important. Very, very important with CLL is that it's a, you know, a very different disease process for different people. It's very important that when someone's diagnosed, we look at their cytogenetics. Um, patients, you know, can have a deletion 17P, T53 mutation, complex karyotype, deletion, um, you know, we look at... 11, you know, um, and then our unmutated IGHV. The biggest thing that we're seeing across the country is these patients are not tested for these um, mutations at diagnosis. Approximately 30% of patients are tested at diagnosis, and that's just subpar care because how they're going to behave, how their disease is treated, really does matter based on these mutations. So. You know, we know that patients, we need to strive for a deeper response. We need to, you know, look at the progression um, of these patients with these mutations. And that's sort of, you know, the reason why we have all these new therapies and new studies and why we're looking at all the different combinations. Okay. Ah, okay. So treatment you know, indications for CLL, um, you know, if patients have constitutional symptoms, their classic B symptoms, you know, whether it's fevers, chills, night sweats, you know, significant fatigue, um, just an overall impact on their quality of life. Um, we can see progressive mar marrow failure. We can see autoimmune complications um, with their hemoglobin, you know, ITP, um, that are poorly responsive to steroids and other therapies. Massive splenomegaly, bulky lymphadenopathy. Um, again, you know, symptomatic extranodal involvement. Um, doesn't have to just be a giant lymph node. It can be, you know, liver involvement, things like that. And then the classic progressive lymphocytosis, you know, a doubling in six months or a more than 50% increase in the count in a two-month period. But again, even if someone is diagnosed with high-risk CLL by their mutations and they're asymptomatic, that's not an indication for treatment. So you really have to take it patient by patient. Again, really quick, we talked about the 
the need to check the cytogenetics um, you know, at diagnosis. The only mutation that does not need to be retested for at progression is the IGHV mutational status. This does not change. So if your patient wasn't tested at diagnosis, you can test them at relapse before starting therapy. Um, but the others always need to be checked at baseline. And then if they're treated and then relapse, you would check again because there can be, you know, clonal evolution and these things can change. Okay, this is not something I'm gonna go through, you know, line by line, but basically this is what it looks like now if you are a patient diagnosed with CLL, so frontline patient. You know, obviously you're always gonna consider a clinical trial if available, and then the biggest thing is you're gonna assess for that TP53 mutation. If patients have that mutation, then really the combination of choice is either a single agent BTK inhibitor plus or minus a benetuzumab. Um, you know, we have three BTK inhibitors, um, you know, covalent BTK inhibitors in, in use currently with abrutinib, acalabrutinib, and xanabrutinib. You'll see with the little box highlighting here that really acalabrutinib and xanu, you know, are, tend to be the BTK, you know, inhibitor of choice um, in this current treatment, you know, time. Um, if patients do not have a TP53 mutation, you know, the fun begins. You know, you look at the IGHV mutation, whether they have it or they don't. You look fit, unfit. But if you look at the boxes here, and I'm sorry the last one was kind of cut off there, really the treatment options are the same. Which So if you really don't know which one to choose, you're really not going to go wrong and the patient's going to do well. So whether it's then in a benetuzumab, BTK inhibitor, plus or minus a benetuzumab, you know, that you're not going to go wrong with that selection. And we'll kind of see the updates in this data as I go through it. But, um, you know, that's really good for the patient that they have so many options and fare well with whatever's, you know, chosen. So I always say that, you know, in the relapse setting for CLL, it's, it's your changing dance partners, okay? So it, it's, you know, if you had a BTK inhibitor, if you had, you know, um, if you were intolerant, you can be rechallenged. If you had progressive disease, then you would go on to venetoclax and vice versa. Now, if you've seen a BTK inhibitor and venetoclax, then the fun really begins. And now things such as non-covalent um, BTK inhibitors, such as pertubrutinib, which we're going to talk about, um, you know, is an option. You can do an anti-CD20 Venn combination. You know, cellular therapy is on the rise for CLL as well. So, you know, again kind of a busy slide, but the ultimate take home is there's multiple options for these patients, which much like myeloma is just wonderful for these patients. Okay, so the key study uh, updates from ASH, again, I, I don't wanna fly through it too much, but even though there's only you know five things listed here, there's a lot of information. So first we're gonna look at Captivate, which is an all oral regimen consisting of a brutinib and venetoclax in the frontline setting. Um, for CLL, GLOW is very similar to Captivate, but it's in our kind of elderly, unfit population. Um, Alpine is the um, if looking at Xanabrutinib. Bruin looks at the Pertubrutinib, and then AVO is our you know how many drugs can we add together salad? Hey, myeloma does it, so CLL needs to do it too. <laughs> Okay, so just, just as a reminder um, for those who are not familiar, you know, Captivate the, had the initial cohort was fixed duration. So the, this is a three-year update. Look, and I wanna just kinda look at the study design because we'll build on this for the MRD cohort. So again, these are patients that were 70 years of age or younger. You know, those are healthy patients, you know, good ECOG. Um, they had a lead-in phase, so they were always started on a brutinib first for three cycles. And then became the combination phase with the abrutinib and then the addition of the venetoclax, which followed the standard five-week wrap-up for venetoclax. They were on the combination for 12 cycles. So it's a total of 15 cycles you know, to the end of treatment. Now, we're going to quickly just look at this before we go into the ASH update, which focused on the MRD cohort. So the primary endpoint for this was you know, CR. Um, you know, per investigator assessment, particularly in patients um, 
without the Dell 17P, and then other key secondary endpoints, as always, you know, overall response rate, duration of response, undetected MRD rates, um, PFS overall survival, and then just looking at some other categories, which we are not going to focus on um, for this. So the really cool thing in the three-year update for best overall response is, no, you know, whether it's for all comers, deletion 17P, or the TP53 mutation patients, they all had an overall response rate of like 97%. So I don't know how you get much better than that. Okay, I'm clearly technically challenged. There we go. Okay. So for PFS, you'll see here that whether the patients had a Dell 17P or unmutated um, IGHV, you know, a 36-month PFS was, was high, you know, above 80%, um, you know, which is excellent when you're talking about this high-risk population. And overall survival, um, you know, was, was favorable in all arms. So looking at, so at ASH, the focus was on the five-year follow-up for the MRD cohort. So, you know, we know that there the BTK inhibitors and the BCL2 inhibitors, you know, the, basically is now the standard of care in CLL. Um, but the preclinical data and early trials have, you know, really showed a synergy between the BTK inhibitors and in this case, abrutinib and venetoclax for BCL2. Um, so you had that synergism without overlapping toxicity, which is, you know, important, you know, when you're talking about, you know, adding multiple therapies to a patient. As we just saw, Captivate was a phase two study assessing the safety and efficacy um, for first line patients using this drug combination. Um, but now we're gonna look at the current analysis for the five-year follow-up from MRD cohort um, in this trial, receiving the continued use of abrutinib versus placebo following confirmed um, undetectable MRD with the frontline treatment. Okay. So, you saw the schema for the lead-in phase, the combination for that total of 15 cycles. At the end of treatment, patients then, by use of, you know, basically MRD-guided randomization, um, if they had confirmed undetectable MRD, meaning confirmed in the bone marrow peripheral blood and on serially for three months, they were confirmed. And so if they have confirmed undetectable MRD, then they were stratified by IGHV mutational status with a double-blind randomization to either receiving continuous abrutinib versus placebo. If they had undetectable MRD but not confirmed, then it was an open-label randomization, again, to either abrutinib um, or um, abrutinib plus ven. So just to highlight here, um, I wanted, you know, the median age was fairly similar for the abrutinib or the placebo arm, but highlighting the high-risk um, genomic features with the DEL 17P, 11Q, um, the complex karyotype and unmutated IGHV, you'll see in the abrutinib arm, um, aside for the unmutated IGHV, which was matched um, in the abrutinib versus placebo, um, more of the high-risk patients were in that abrutinib arm. Again, the sample size is not huge, but you'll see here that there were more patients um, meeting that high-risk um, you know, disease uh, characteristics. So this is the MRD cohort update um, for three years disease-free survival. So that started at the randomization based on the MRD. Okay, so you'll see here um, for the three-year DFS percent um, in the abrutinib arm, this was 93%, and in the placebo arm, this was 85%. So again, you'll see here the drop off. That you know, you'll see the line dividing the you know the fixed duration. Then they were randomized based on the MRD um, to either arm. So you know, really, both groups fared very well. So obviously we care about PFS um, and overall survival. Um, so the PFS rate, which I mean, again, very impressive at 48 months, um, you know, it was similar in patients with unmutated IGHV, um, which is fantastic. You'll see here that the rate for the placebo arm was 88% and then the abrutinib arm was 95%. And again, in all of our studies, you know, there seems to be like, you know, you can look at one or two percentage differences for overall survival, but overall survival is excellent in all arms. The three-year DFS rate, um, four-year PFS, and four-year overall survival rate in patients with the high-risk features, so the Dell 17 p TP53 mutation or complex karyotype was similar to the overall population. So they did well whether they were randomized to the placebo or 
the abrutinib arm, um, which again is, is good for our patients. This was really interesting and I think good to see as we've seen from a lot of other studies looking at MRD. Um, MRD tends to deepen over time um, and so does the CR rate. So, you know, things can get better the longer, you know, you're off treatment in the placebo arm and then you'll see also here a slight improvement in this um, over the placebo arm in the abrutinib arm. So MRD negativity rates were sustained three years post-randomization and similar in patients randomized to placebo versus continued abrutinib. You'll see here that the sustainability of MRD negativity um, in the, um, the intent to treat population was comparable to that observed in the evaluable population. So that's great. Um, you'll see the risk, you know, the, basically whether you're in the um, a brutinum arm or the placebo arm um, at 12 cycles, 24 or 36, you know, MRD was, you know, close to 80% in each one of these arms, which also held true in, um, in the intent to treat population. Obviously, um, in the abrutinib arm, it was 84% at 12 cycles, 60% at 24, and then 63% um, at the 36 mark. So the three-year disease-free survival rates um, remain not significantly different between the confirmed undetectable MRD arms. So you'll see here um, with the abrutinib and the placebo at 41 months um, after stopping treatment, the three-year disease-free survival rate in the placebo arm remains similar to that in the abrutinib arm, so 85% versus 93%. The progression-free survival rates continue to be high and durable, again, across study, study arms. Um, at 48 months, the PFS was 88% in the placebo arm and 95% um, with the continued abrutinib arm. Um, for progressive disease and um, retreatment options, or oh, sorry, outcomes, three of seven patients with the progressive disease in the placebo arm have initiated retreatment with abrutinib and all have remained, um, achieved a PR, which is excellent. And then two patients in the abrutinib arm had progressive disease, um, but none have initiated um, retreatment. Again, this is kind of just staying with the theme, um, progression free survival, you know, in the IGHV mutated or unmutated patients, the PFS rates, you know, are excellent um, and similar to the total population. And again, overall survival, you know, um, not a huge difference, which is excellent um, and still, you know, continues to look great, 100% actually in the placebo arm and 98% in the abrutinib arm. So this is kind of just a summary. Um, I do want to draw attention to the fact that for the placebo cohort, I can't speak this morning, excuse me, the placebo cohort, um, looking at the Dell 17P, you know, the N is small, okay? So like the percentages look great and there's no reason to think they wouldn't be, but it is a small N. So that is something to sort of be aware of. But um, the, the disease-free survival rate um, at three years is 85% for all comers in the placebo arm, 93% for all comers in the abrutinib arm, and then 100% for the DEL17P in the placebo arm and 95% in the abrutinib arm. Again, PFS rate for at four years is you know, excellent. You'll see here, I mean, 88% in the placebo arm, 95% in abrutinib, and then we were talking about the high-risk groups you know, actually, they even they even better, and overall survival really can't get much better. So, what that was showing us, I guess, in summary, is that even if patients say there's a patient who truly is on fixed duration and is randomized to the placebo arm, that yes, there seems to be a small percentage benefit with a brutinib when you're looking at you know the data, but these patients really do have a fixed duration option and still do very very well. Um, so just kind of switching gears um, which to GLOW, which is very similar to Captivate, but this was a phase three trial. And again, this is in patients that are, you know, that are a little bit older or the same age but unfit, you know, significant comorbidities. Um, and so they kind of got their own trial. But this trial used the abrutinib Ven and compared it to chlorambucil and abinutuzumab. Okay, so this had a comparator arm. Um, the primary endpoint was PFS um, per IRC, and then secondary endpoints, again, undetectable MRD in bone marrow, CR rate um, per IRC, and overall response. We also looked at overall survival. 
So the progression-free survival by IRC remains superior for a brutinumab ven versus chloramucilib and atuzumab with four years of study follow-up. So that was the updated ASH was the four was the four-year data. So you'll see here very clearly, um, you know, the median PFS, you know, wasn't was not reached, but you'll see here that 74.8 percent versus 24.8 percent. Um, you know the. It's, which is excellent when you're talking about, um, you know, this time frame on, on a, you know, on a fixed duration treatment. And the brutinib and ven reduced the risk of progression or um, or death by 79 percent um, versus the obinutuzumab carambucilarm. What this is showing us is that patients achieved undetectable MRD early um, during treatment with the brutinib ven, um, but you know over time. Um, this declined by a, like less than 10% per year. So that's, you know, the decline, which obviously, you know, no one wants, but it's very small over time. And most patients, like I said, achieved um, the undetectable MRD early. Um, two years post-treatment, nearly 40% of patients had still maintained undetectable MRD, um, and including a, about a quarter of these patients actually achieved a deeper um, response in MRD over time. Okay, um, so oops, sorry, a brutin event improved PFS versus carambucil and abinutuzumab regardless of MRD status at the end of treatments and then three months after. Um, you'll see here very clearly like whether they had you know detectable or undetectable. There's a significant difference between um, the chloramucil arm. Um, with a brutin and ven, there was low impact of the end of treatment, you know, plus three months MRD status um, on PFS post-treatment rate at two years. Um, the abrutinib then improved PFS um, over the chloramucilib and regardless of IGHV mutation status. Um, more than 90% of patients in the abrutinib and ven arm did not require subsequent therapy at 3.5 years and maintained a 91.5% PFS for the unmutated IGHV, so the higher risk characteristics, and 93% in the mutated IGHV. Again, kind of keeping with the same theme, more than 90% at, at two years post-treatment for patients um, with undetectable MRD um, at end of treatment and three months after, you know, was maintained regardless of IGHV mutational status. Overall survival, um, you'll see here there's a difference in the percentages. Um, in the chlorambucil and abinutuzumab arb, 39 out of 41 patients um, requiring subsequent treatment received a BTK inhibitor or venetoclax. Majority of deaths in the chlorambucil O arm um, occurred while off any treatment, and more infection-related deaths were seen in the chlorambucil and abinutuzumab arm. So just a summary of the update. Um, again, this is a four-year update that came out of ASH, which made a lot of us who treat CLL very excited for this, you know, all oral regimen in our in our older patients. Um, so with a median 46-month follow-up, um, I and the brutinib and reduced the risk of disease progression or death by 79% versus chlorambucil and um, This is the first fixed duration novel combination to demonstrate an overall survival, so I, I can't talk, overall survival advantage compared to chloramucil benetuzumab in the frontline treatment for CLL. An estimated 74.6% of previously untreated older and or core morbid patients were alive um, and progression free at 3.5 years with an all oral once daily fixed duration um, you know, combination therapy um, compared to an estimated 24.8% in the chlorambucil and atuzumab arm. The PFS at 3.5 years was higher for patients in the combination oral arm compared to the chlorambucil and atuzumab for both the unmutated, so higher risk um, patients and mutated IGHV and CLL. The PFS was better and sustained in the abrutinib venetoclex arm compared to the chlorambucil abinutuzumab arm regardless of MRD um, at end of treatment and then three months. And then two years after the end of treatment, the estimated PFS was greater than 90% for patients with mutated IGHV independent of MRD status. And for the 60% of patients with the unmutated IGHV um, who received undetectable MRD. So, you know, just that's very, very encouraging. Um, and patients, 
you know, love the idea of not having to come in for IV therapy. Okay, so switching gears, um, still including our BTK inhibitors, but um, at ASH, this was big news. Um, Alpine had the late breaking abstract, um, which was very exciting. Um, so here we looked and showed that Xanabrutinib demonstrates superior progression free survival compared with the Brutinib for treatment of relapsed refractory CLL and small lymphocytic lymphoma. And this is the results, the final analysis from Alpine, which is a randomized three, phase three study. Okay, so for the trial design, um, patients had to have relapse, re so it's a phase three, patients had to have relapse refractory CLL requiring treatment. They had to have measurable disease by imaging, um, no current or past history of Richter's transformation, and no prior treatment with a BTK inhibitor. They were stratified based on age, less than 65 or older than 65, geographical region, um, refractory status, and then their DEL17P um, mutation, present or absent. They were then screened and randomized to either receive Xanabrutinib at 160 milligrams twice a day versus a Brutinib at the standard 420 milligrams daily. Primary endpoints were overall response rate, um, both in non-inferiority and a superiority assessed by the investigator. Key secondary endpoints included PFS, um, and incidence of atrial fibrillation, which we are concerned about with the BTK inhibitors. And then other secondary endpoints included overall survival, duration of response, time to next treatment, um, time, time to treatment failure, um, and then we're not gonna look at the partial response with lymphocytosis, but we're gonna look at the other things. So best overall response, we're gonna look at this by IRC um, and investigator, but we're excellent. Overall response rate, um, 86%, um, you know, for Xanabrutinib compared to the 75% for Imbrutinib. Um, the overall response rate in the intent to treat population was higher with Xanabrutinib compared with the Brutinib, like I said, by both the investigator assessment and the IRC. Here's the investigator still, you know, above 80% for the overall response rate in the Xanu arm versus 74% um, in the Imbrutinib arm. So progression-free survival by the investigator in the intent to treat population, you'll see here, you know, close to 80% um, in the uh, Xanabrutinib arm, you know, versus 65% in the Abrutinib arm. The median follow-up was 29, um, you know, 0.6 months. The median PFS, like I said, was not reached with Xanabrutinib and was 34.2 months with Abrutinib. This held true um, in the IRC um, progression-free survival analysis as well. Um, 88 Xanabrutinib treated patients and 120 treated um, with Imbrutinib um, experienced progression of disease um, or died. The most common primary method of disease progression in both treatment arms was increase in lymph nodes. Um, this was in 40 patients in the Xanu arm and about 61 patients in the Abrutinib arm. So, you know, we always break things down and look further at deletion 17P and IGHV. So you'll see here that in both the investigator assessed and the IRC um, PFS data um, for patients who had the deletion 17P, patients in the Xanu arm, um, you know, did significantly better than patients in the abrutinib arm. For high-risk patients, as we just talked about, there was longer PFS demonstrated with Xanu than abrutinib. Um, and so this is, you know, had, this is very encouraging for our patients. So overall survival, um, so numerically there were fewer deaths reported in the Xanabrutinib arm compared to the abrutinib arm. Um, and the hazard ratio um, for overall survival comparing Xanu to abrutinib was 0 0.76, so not quite statistically significant, um, but you know you can sort of look at the separation of the, you know a little bit of separation of the curves as they kind of plateau out. But the patients are both doing well, um, and the median over overall survival has not been reached in either treatment group. So basically, this table is breaking up um, IRC assessed and investigator assessed duration of response. Um, 
to highlight here in both the top and the bottom categories, the median duration of response was not reached for Xanabrutinib in either the IRC or the investigator assessed, um, but was you know above 30% um, for abrutinib in in both arms, um, which you know about 33.9%. At 24 months, the event-free um, rate was higher for Xanabrutinib treated patients than the abrutinib treated patients by both investigator and IRC, IRC assessment. Um, the investigator assessment for Xanabrutinib was 79.5% um, and 71.3% for abrutinib um, and very similar um, for the IRC assessment. So 77% for Xanabrutinib and 67% for the abrutinib. And as I was mentioning, you know, for those of us who use BTK inhibitors, um, obviously cardiovascular AEs are very important, right? rates of atrial fibrillation. Um, it's always something we have to take into account when treating these patients. Um, so it's very, very favorable um, for Xanabrutinib. Um, there's a lower rate of serious cardiac AEs um, reported with Xanu. Um, two of six xanabrutinib-treated patients um, versus 16 of 25 abrutinib-treated patients um, had the cardiovascular AEs um, with no prior cardiac history. One xanabrutinib-treated patient discontinued due to a cardiac AE versus 14 patients who were on the abrutinib arm. There were no fatal or cardiac events reported in patients treated with Xanu, and there were six events in patients that were treated with abrutinib. Three deaths occurred within four months of abrutinib initiation, and then three deaths occurred two to three years after abrutinib initiation. So it's important to kind of keep that in mind when selecting BTK inhibitors. Okay, maybe not. Ah, there we go. So this is showing the time to the event, so the time to developing the cardiac. Um, disorders, you'll see here there's a slower rate of development um, in the xanabrutinib arm compared to abrutinib, an overall lower incident of the cardiac disorders um, with the xanabrutinib at 21% versus the 29% with abrutinib. Um, we all worry about atrial fibrillation um, with the BTK inhibitors, and here, very similar to what you saw on the past slide, that the rates of AFib, aflutter were lower with xanabrutinib versus abrutinib. Um, for, for any grade, 5.2% with xanabrutinib versus 13% with abrutinib. Um, and then for grade three or higher events, 2.5% um, for xanu and then 4% for abrutinib. Um, three xanabrutinib and five abrutinib treated patients who had atrial fibrillation um, had a medical history of atrial fibrillation. Okay, so the conclusions for what I was just going through for the Alpine study, for the final PFS analysis, um, xanabrutinib demonstrated superior PFS over abrutinib in patients with relapse refractory CLL or SLL. There was a PFS benefit seen across all major subgroups, again, in that high-risk population, the DEL17P, TP53 mutation, um, you know, mutated patients. Um, xanabrutinib has a favorable safety profile compared with abrutinib, lower rate of grade three or higher in serious AEs, and then fewer AEs um, leading to treatment discontinuation and dose reduction. Xanabrutinib has a better cardiac profile than abrutinib with lower rates of serious cardiac events um, or cardiac events leading to treatment discontinuation or fatal cardiac events. And Alpine is the first study to demonstrate PFS superiority in a head-to-head -head comparison with another BTK inhibitor in the relapse refractory CLL population. And xanabrutinib has now demonstrated superiority to abrutinib um, in both PFS and overall response as well. Okay, so switching off the um, covalent BTK inhibitors and now moving over into the non-covalent um, BTK inhibitor realm, we have pertubrutinib, which has been studied in the Bruin study, which is a phase one, two study. Um, again, this is, a, this is not a covalent. This is for patients who have previously seen a covalent BTK inhibitor and have progressed. Um, it's a highly selective, I said non-covalent reversible BTK inhibitor. Um, it's well tolerated and demonstrates promising efficacy um, in this poor prognostic sort of B cell population of patients. Um, and it, what the graph is showing here is that it maintains, um, it maintains the inhibition at the BTK, you know, 
over its full um, you know, dosing uh, potential. So there are limited therapeutic options and poor outcomes after covalent BTK inhibitor treatment, um, you know, especially because a lot of these patients have seen both the covalent BTK inhibitors and venetoclax or, or some combination. And so, you know, as we I showed very early on, when you start switching dance partners, what do you do if you've seen both? We know that once these patients progress um, after seeing a covalent BTK inhibitor and BCL2, you know, their disease progresses and they don't do as well. So they need another therapy option. So with prolonged follow-up from the initial clinical trials of the covalent BTK inhibitors, a substantial population um, of these patients will discontinue the BTK inhibitors or BCL2. Um, we see it more in BTK inhibitors, but they'll, they'll stop, you know, not just for progression, but for intolerance. Um, there's limited prospective data that exists on the efficacy and safety of available or investigational therapy in the post-covalent BTKI setting. Within nine years since the initial abrutinib approval, which is crazy to think it's been around that long, um, an increasing number of patients are now seeking therapy after their covalent BTK inhibitor. Um, the great thing for our CLL patients is they've achieved such longevity on you know, oral therapy that to, to think that they've sustained that PFS this long, you know, and, but they come to a point that it's at some point for some of these patients, their current strategy you know, will, will stop working. Um, and an increasing number of these patients have also discontinued venetoclax, um, where our outcomes are then particularly poor. So pertubrutinib efficacy um, in these CLL patients who received um, prior BTK inhibitor treatment, you know, is excellent. You'll see here by the waterfall pot, plot, excuse me, um, whether they've had prior BTKI discontinuation for progression or prior um, DC for toxicity or seen a prior BCL2 inhibitor, they all regain control of response, which is, you know, very exciting and, re, you know, reassuring. Now, looking at the table to the, you know, the top right, or I guess, yeah, your top right, um, these patients may not have achieved a CR, but over 70% of them achieved a PR. And when you're talking about a heavily treated population of patients who've not only seen a BTK, you know, and or a BCL2 inhibitor, to still be able to get over, you know, three quarters of them or close to three quarters of them, you know, into a PR, I mean, that's, you know, that's impressive and, you know, at least offers another treatment option. This is kind of a busy slide. Basically, we have looking at the um, the C481 mutation. So we're not routinely testing for this yet um, in real time, but just as patients develop resistance to drugs in CML, we know that patients can develop resistance to the BTK inhibitors if they harbor the C481 mutation. Um, Pertubrutinib shows efficacy, whether you're mutated or wild type, which is encouraging and offers another treatment option for these patients. Um, the patients who are younger tend to do a little bit better. Again, you know, the curves aren't substantially different, but you do see obviously one goes down and one starts to plateau. Um, same thing for the DEL um, 17P and, and or TP53 mutation. Um, you know, it has efficacy in both of these, you know, both of these groups. Um, and the good thing is if you do have these high-risk mutations, yes, you drop off, but then you also plateau. Again, offering um, another option for therapy in this high-risk group. Um, whether you've had a prior BTKI, chemoimmunotherapy, BCL2 inhibitor, PI3 kinase therapy, you know, this shows that pertubrutinib still has efficacy in this extremely heavily treated population. Obviously, you know, you're not going to see the robust response, but you definitely still see a response, and this does continue, you know, close to 20 months. So progression-free survival in CLL and SLL patients who receive prior BTK inhibitor um, treatment. So all prior BTKI patients who've seen a median of prior, like three lines of therapy. So again, heavily pretreated group. Um, the median follow-up was 19.4 months um, for patients who received a prior BTK inhibitor. Again, you'll see here that PFS, you know, was achieved, was high, but does go down over time, but eventually plateaus. Um, if patients have seen a prior BTK inhibitor and BCL2 inhibitor um, with a median prior lines of five, five different therapies, 
again, you see a fairly quick and high PFS um, rate, but then it does decrease over time. But you know, again, they're, they're still getting sustained response. Um, and the median follow-up for that treatment population um, was 18.2 months. So with more than two years of additional data, pertubrutinib continues to demonstrate clinically meaningful and durable efficacy in our CLL, SLL patients previously treated with BTK inhibitors. Favorable efficacy was observed regardless of the C40 and one mutation status, age, the high risk T53 or DEL mutation, um, and in those with additional lines of therapy. Notably, this was observed in patients with relapsed refractory disease after prior BTK treatment um, and BCL2 treatment. There's consistently a high overall response rate observed across all the different subgroups. It continues to be well tolerated with low rates of grade three AEs um, and low rates of discontinuation due to drug toxicity. Um, there are several trials um, looking at pertubrutinib, um, you can see below, and you guys will all have a copy of these slides, um, but there's monotherapy versus BR in the treatment naive setting. There's a head-to-head -head, um, versus a brutinib. Um, there's a monotherapy versus investigator's choice, so idelisib, rituxim versus BR in post-BTKI. So sort of what a, what a send looked like for a calibrutinib, but this is just a little bit different following covalent BTKI inhibitor. Um, and then we have the last one, which is the combination with venetoclax and rituxin versus venetoclax plus rituxin. So again, the triplet versus the doublet. Okay, so, you know, more is always better, right? Um, who knows? <laughs> um, but this ABO um, is a phase two frontline um, study in high risk patients. Very, you know, newer study, but, you know, promising, um, and this was a big thing at ASH as well. So just to kind of remind everyone, so Elevate TN was a combination of a calibrutinib and a binutuzumab, um, which was highly effective as frontline therapy in CLL, treatment-naive CLL, um, with significantly longer PFS versus chloramucil plus a binutuzumab. Eventually, we're going to stop using chloramucil and a binutuzumab as the comparator arm um, and lower rates of AEs. Um, the management of patients with, you know, TP53 altered disease really remains challenging. You know, we worry about I, unmutated IGHV as well, but we just know these patients with the 17P and or TP53 are just a high risk group, and we just need to better understand them, you know, as we go along. So triplet regimens with BTK inhibitors, you know, are out there um, being looked at with combinations with Ven and Abinutuzumab. We have the phase two IVO um, study in treatment naive um, and relapse refractory for all comers. Phase two IVO in treatment naive high risk CLL. Phase two study as we're gonna talk about here um, for AVO. And then we also have Bovin, which is the phase two study um, you know, with Xanabrutinib. Um, so this current phase two study is designed to determine efficacy and the safety of AVO as a frontline therapy for patients with CLL enriched with that high risk, you know, um, mutation population. So patients had to be um, 18 years of age or older, um, previously untreated, so treatment naive, you know, good uh, ECOG performance status, um, and then if TP53 alterations, you know, they were allowed um, in the expansion cohort. So first patients received 16 cycles of the triplet combination, ABO, um, after 16 cycles, their MRD was assessed. If they were MRD negative, then they were not on treatment, but they had the ability to have um, peripheral blood MRD tested every three months. If they had MRD detectable in the marrow, then they, were, then they received a calibrutinib and VEN for an additional nine cycles. After the nine cycles, so 25 total, ABO, and then um, just the Acala and VEN, Depending on MRD status, they were then, you know, done with treatment or again continued on um, with a calibrutinib and venetoclax. Um, other study requirements: a mandatory prophylaxis, um, so you know, with Bactrim, you know, acyclovir. Um, primary endpoint was CR rate with undetectable MRD in the bone marrow after 15 cycles, and then secondary endpoints included safety, overall response rate, PFS, EFS, and then remission duration. Again, small study right now, early, 
Um, but you'll see here that um, overall response rate was almost 100%. I mean, so CRs, about 50%, PRs, about 50%, and that didn't matter whether they had a P53 mutation or not. So, you know, pretty encouraging. Again, early study, small population, um, but definitely showing efficacy. Um, again, very similar, um, looking at just the different groups um, with the 17P or T53 mutation, um, either wild type or without the mutation, I should say. Looking at um, MRD in the peripheral blood and bone marrow, again, most patients, whether they were high risk or not, achieved undetectable MRD um, with the triplet combination. Again, I'm not going to go through all of this just for time's sake, but um, undetectable MRD was seen in um, the in the marrow and in the blood. Um, you know in this high risk, in, after 25 cycles, I should say, excuse me. Um, and then detectable MRD was actually very, very small. So nearly all patients after completing 25 cycles, if they were randomized on afterwards, um, achieved undetectable MRD. So little quick synopsis, survival, okay? So disease progression occurred in four patients. One CLL um, patient progressed with a del 17 p and TP53 mutation. Two had Hodgkin's transformation because of a notch one mutation. Um, one diffuse large B cell. Um, there was one development of one diffuse large B cell uh, um, from CLL, so a Richter's um, in a TP53, TP53, I can't talk, TP53 um, mutated patient and with complex karyotype. One death on study due to COVID-19 pneumonia, which I mean, obviously, you know, in the era of all these trials, you know, COVID was rampant, right? So that's pretty impressive. Um, at median follow-up of 35 months, 98.5% of patients remained alive um, and 92.6% progression-free. Um, so correlative studies, um, patients with PR had a lower percent change in their cytochrome C release compared to those who achieved a CR. So something just, you know, on the side. Um, and patients with CR appeared to have significantly higher dependence on the BCL2 um, by the BH3 profile. These are things that we look at sort of, you know, in supplementary studies, but, you know, it was mentioned here, so I thought I would include it. So in this phase two study with a cohort of untreated patients with CLL enriched for high risk disease with the combination of AVO, um, they yielded high response. At cycle 16, the bone marrow had undetectable MRD um, in 83% of patients with TP53 altered disease. After median of 35 months follow-up, 93% of patients remained progression free. 41 patients with the TP53 alteration were in this group, and one patient experienced disease progression. Treatment with acalabrutinib, ben, and obinutuzumab was well tolerated, and cardiac and infection AEs were uncommon. Um, again, this is ongoing um, with the phase three trial, um, and then obviously um, investigators concluded that these results support the use of MRG, MRD guided fixed duration treatment with ABO in patients with CLL, particularly in high risk disease. Okay, I'm going fast. Quickly, because we're going to hear about this after lunch, so I am going to let the experts take it over, but I'm a big fan of MRD testing. Um, so just really, really quick. Um, so the multi-parametric flow cytometry that we've conventionally used, I almost like want to say in the ice ages, but I know is still used to detect um, MRD, you know, really is, is inferior to the next-gen sequencing. We're going to hear about ClonoSeq and Adaptive after lunch. Um, but basically, these patients who were MFC negative, um, what we thought were, M, you know, MRD negative by this treatment modality, when you see here, 59% of these patients that were deemed negative when ClonoSeq was done on them using the NGS technology, 59% um, of them were actually positive. And I just wanted to show this, that assessment of MRD using ClonoSeq enables better understanding of the disease kinetics in CLL. You know, so if your MRD is going up or you're becoming, you know, less negative, you have a positive growth phase. Same thing, MRD is deepening, so you have even better response. You have a negative growth phase, so no growth. So really, really important. If you want to have a take-home message of anything, that is key, and we will hear more about that. Um, those were the big ASH updates. I was going to quickly go through what we already know, but 
Um, you know, we have basically great, um, great regimens. We talked about in my initial treatment kind of paradigm there about the combination of abinutuzumab and Ven um, from the CLL14 study, which we, you know, all use in our practices. The five-year PFS rate, median PFS not reached at five years, and in the VED, abinutuzumab arm, um, the five-year PFS rate is still 62.6%. The Elevate TN study, which is a calibrutinib and abinutuzumab um, versus um, abinutuzumab and chlorambucil, um, the five-year follow-up data still shows superior PFS, whether it's a cala in combination with abinutuzumab, calibrutinib monotherapy, um, you know, superior to um, the chlorambucidal benetuzumab arm. And the same thing was true in, I'm just gonna go through all of this. Um, same thing was true for the four-year follow-up for Ascend, which is looking at a calibrutinib versus rituxan plus dealer's choice of either idolisib or bendamustine. So bottom line is, and I'll be done, is that you know we have multiple treatment options currently available multiple treatment options that are coming in the near future for our CLL patients, both in the treatment naive and refractory populations. So again, being a CLL patient right now, like being a myeloma patient, the sky's the limit. It makes it very exciting to treat these patients and just to be able to offer them, you know, numerous, um, you know, numerous options and really, to, you know, to just keep them alive and traveling and doing what they like to do. So I know we'll have questions later on the panel. Rapid fire, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. As she did say, we will do, um, we have some questions from the virtual audience, so we'll address those during the panel discussion uh, later today. We now do have a break, so you can take some time to grab some coffee, stretch your legs, head to the bathroom. We have some snacks in the exhibitor room. Um, for those of you that are virtual, please.